A background check revealed Chase's previous brushes with the law, including the strange incident at Pyramid Lake. It also provided an address. Emotions among the detectives were running high as they set off to confront the man they suspected of killing five people and kidnapping a 22-month-old boy. On the way out here, Detective Roberts and Ken Baker and myself were convinced that Richard Chase was our killer. I had it in my mind already that if the baby was there, I was going to kill Chase. That was it. That's thoughts the cops aren't supposed to have, but this guy was bizarre. And that's it, you know, we would just execute this guy on the scene. When we arrived at the apartment complex, we parked in the lot here and went in to make contact with the manager. She confirmed that he was in apartment 15. So Detective Baker, Roberts, and myself knocked on the door of apartment 15. There was no response. Knock, 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 no response. There was a vacant apartment next door to his. Uh, Ken Baker went inside, listened to the wall. We could hear movement inside the apartment. We, at that point, did not have a warrant for the apartment. We didn't have an arrest warrant. So I asked Bill Roberts to go back to the manager's apartment, call Ray Bionde, our supervisor, ask him for some advice. You know, we were new detectives, you know. While they waited for word from their supervisor, the detectives took up new positions. The sudden silence led Chase to believe they'd given up their search. Chase did, in fact, think we were leaving. He came out with his box full of rags. He looked, he saw me, and he started running. At the time, he's looking back over his shoulder as I'm chasing him. He gets down here to 14. This is where Detective Baker was. Smacked him on the head. Ken knocked him down. And then we jumped on him, wrestled around with him. Irie and his colleague were now gripped in a violent struggle with a man who had killed and mutilated indiscriminately, and he was armed. His gun was in a holster underneath the jacket on his chest. I pulled my service revolver out, I stuck it in his ear, I told him to quit fighting or I was gonna blow his brains out. Well, he didn't quit fighting, and that's when I found out I'm not like him. Even though I believe that it would have been a good shooting, it would have been a justified shooting, I couldn't kill him and I would have been justified in doing it. Because the average person, cops included, are not like these people. He's a cold-blooded killer, and we aren't. The detectives finally managed to overpower their suspect without a shot being fired. As Chase was taken into custody, detectives entered apartment 15 looking for the missing baby, David Ferreira. Just nearly every surface in the apartment was covered with blood. The couch was covered with blood, uh, the kitchen counter, the sink, and the bathroom, uh, on the carpet. Uh, there were strange-looking uh, substance in jars in this refrigerator. In a blender, there was what appeared to have been organs, maybe animal or, or human. Uh, might have even been mixed with Coca-Cola. But the missing baby was nowhere to be found. On the 28th of January 1978, serial killer Richard Trenton Chase was apprehended fleeing his apartment in Sacramento. Behind him was a trail of murder and mutilation that left five dead and a 22-month-old infant, David Ferreira, missing. A search of his apartment had revealed evidence of his guilt. The couch was covered with blood, uh, the kitchen counter, the sink, and the bathroom. In a blender, there was what appeared to have been organs, maybe animal or, or human. But there was no sign of the missing child. 
As the detective who made the arrest, Wayne Irie was given the opportunity to interrogate Chase first. During the interrogation, he admitted to killing dogs. I tried every little trick I could, but he would never admit to killing people. And then I turned to lay some more photographs out, and when I looked back like this, Chase's head was right here, right next to my shoulder. Startled me. When I did it, I turned back, his head is here. What the hell are you doing? Well, that did. That shut that man up right there. Now, as I become more experienced, I believe now, if I would have put my arm around him, I could see the tears welling up in his eyes, he would have cracked and confessed. I believe that in my heart. Irie had failed to get a confession or information on the whereabouts of the infant David Ferreira. Prosecuting attorney Ronald Tochterman joined new detectives in the next wave of questioning. Some of his responses suggested that he was delusional. People were out to get him. He might have mentioned the Nazis or the Italians. Those were recurring things. When he was advised, he said he wanted an attorney. And I remember then I intervened and I said, well, theoretically, he has the right to uh, refuse to answer. We, we are supposed to stop questioning him at this point, but I'm going to, going to persist because at that point, the baby was still unfound. We didn't know where the baby was. So I did question him, but he was he would he would not acknowledge anything he was not forthcoming at all it will be almost two months before the whereabouts of the infant were finally discovered several months in fact in march of 1978 we found or discovered where david Ferrer was what had happened is a caretaker at this church had discovered the body in a cardboard box in this void area between the buildings. The body was badly decomposed. His head was decapitated, but all the remains and his clothing were in, within this box. So this was the scene after months and months of uh, diligent searching for the body. Richard Trenton Chase had claimed the lives of six innocent people. In 1979, he would be tried for his crimes. Defense attorney Faris Salami entered a plea of insanity. The whole case with Richard Chase was one of mental disease. He uh, was about 27 or 8 years old when I met him in the jail. That was a day or two at the most after he was arrested. I got the opinion very soon, I don't know how quickly, but he's the most deranged fellow I ever met. The prosecution, however, were confident that Chase had known right from wrong when he had committed the murders, and so was technically sane in the eyes of California law. The stuff that was found in his house was very, very incriminating. And I remember approaching the trial with the idea that um, it wasn't going to be much of a challenge to convince a jury that he was the one who killed these people. The, the uh, challenge was going to be to convince them that he was legally sane when he killed the people. And then ultimately, when we got to the penalty phase, that the appropriate punishment was death. On the stand, Chase admitted to drinking his victim's blood and to decapitating the infant in order to obtain more. He said he thought it would be therapeutic. Chase described himself as a good person, although weak in heart and mind. To be insane means you, you uh, don't know the nature of what you've done you don't understand the nature of uh, your offense, and you don't uh, know how to distinguish it right from wrong. Most people that do these horrific things, they know that they're doing something wrong, so you, they, 
the public thinks, well, anyone who would do something like that must be crazy, but no. Uh, <laughs> they're maybe cruel, but they're not crazy. He did a lot to cover up uh, his crimes. He did a lot to uh, prevent the police from finding him. He denied having killed the victims when he was confronted, all of which suggested that he knew that what he had done was wrong. And there were, there were a lot of other things that suggested that as well. He did a lot of things, which the prosecution will tell you, that show that he was thinking. You know, he took rubber gloves with him to protect himself. But he never, on the other hand, he never cleaned himself up. People saw this blood on him all the time. He never got a haircut. He wandered in and out of people's yards. Uh, he never seemed to, buy, to be trying to conceal this appearance, which is kind of the other side of it. But would the jury judge him to have been insane? The difference between life and death. In May 1979, they delivered their verdict. Within 10 days, Richard Chase will be taken from the jail here to San Quentin State Prison, where he will be housed on condemned row. Richard Trenton Chase was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to death. But what had driven Chase to commit his appalling crimes? Was he a born killer? Or had something in his upbringing turned him into one? If he was um, abused at all, it may have been by his father with the belt, you know, for some of his outrageous actions. However, uh, I would have to say that uh, that wouldn't make somebody crazy. The truly brutalized uh, young people, real cruelty and consistent humiliation. All of those things are very important factors nudging the person in the direction of uh, later violence or crime, but you don't make somebody schizophrenic that way. If Chase had suffered no abuse, was his future as a serial killer rooted in neglect? This man was a schizophrenic a paranoid schizophrenic and I feel it's a tragedy that he wasn't given the help that would have stopped him from killing uh, other fellow human beings. What was striking to me about the mother is that when one time uh, he uh, like knocked on her door and you know, she heard a noise or something and there he was and he had a dead, he was holding a dead cat and blood was smeared all over, uh, she didn't do anything. I think once you are beginning to torture animals on a regular basis, then simply you're learning that for yourself that you are able to do this. You become desensitized to the pain that another sentient being has uh, at your hands, and therefore you become socialized into imagining that how you are behaving is acceptable behavior it is but a short step to then feel that they are able to engage in the same types of behavior, not with animals, but with other human beings. I think the best way to understand Chase from a diagnostic standpoint uh, is that he was schizophrenic and that then he uh, suffered serious breakdown in adolescence because of the aggravation of his uh, genetic potential by uh, these um, as we say, psychotomimetic or hallucinogenic drugs. No human being is immune to the genetic background that they bring and the environmental issues that work on them. Was it that he had that gene mutation acted on by the familial history, by the drugs, and by the disappointment he had in his relationships? Obviously, he must have been born to kill, but the factors that added on to that change when he was an adolescent, when everything in the brain changes, we don't know the answer to that yet.
Serial Killer Sunday continues after the break with Peter Tobin, who it's believed could be the unidentified murderer dubbed Bible John.